Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. My name is Megan Robertson, and I'm the Associate Curator of Interpretation here at the Frist Center. Thank you for joining us for our opening lecture for the exhibition, Ink, Silk, and Gold, Islamic Art from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. We're so pleased to have the curator of Ink, Silk, and Gold, Laura Weinstein, with us this evening to tell us about this beautiful exhibition. Laura Weinstein is the Ananda Kumar Kumaraswamy Curator of South Asian and Islamic Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She completed her PhD in 2011 at Columbia University, where she researched illustrated manuscripts produced in the Sultanate of Golconda in the late 16th century and early 17th century. She is the author of articles exploring Dakani manuscripts of the Shahnama and other Persian and Urdu texts the reception of Persian manuscripts in the Deccan, and the dynamics of cultural exchange in Indo-Persianate societies. Since arriving at the Museum of Fine Arts in 2009, she has curated several exhibitions of paintings and manuscripts drawing on the museum's Islamic and South Asian collections. In 2011, she led the reinstallation of the museum's superb South and Southeast Asian collections, as well as a concurrent show of Rajput paintings. Her most recent exhibition, Pure Souls, the Jane Path to Perfection displayed Jane manuscripts, manuscript pages, and related sculptures in an installation co-curated with Dr. Phyllis Granoff of Yale University. She is currently co-curating an exhibition of contemporary art from Asian megacities to open in 2016, as well as the reinstallation of the MFA's Islamic collection upon its return to Boston in 2017. Ink, Silk, and Gold is organized by the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and we gratefully acknowledge our sponsors for the exhibition. The 2015 Ingram Gallery Platinum sponsor is the HCA Foundation on behalf of HCA and TriStar Health. We thank our silver sponsor, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, and our supporting sponsor, the Nissan Foundation. Our hospitality sponsor is Union Station Hotel. We also recognize the Metropolitan Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their generous ongoing operating support. I hope that you'll join us tomorrow in this auditorium at noon to hear the artist perspective by Shanique Smith, who has an exhibition, Shanique Smith, Wonder and Rainbows, on view in our Gordon Contemporary Artist Projects Gallery. Like I said, she'll be here at noon, and the lecture is free with gallery admission. I also hope that you'll be here with us on Tuesday, August 13th, or excuse me, October 13th, for the first lecture in our Food for Thought series, which features a panel of scholars from Vanderbilt University discussing early Islamic art and culture and a free lunch. Reservations are required for that program. Please visit fristcenter.org for details. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us this evening and for your lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Laura Weinstein to the stage. Thank you very much, Megan. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and thank you also to the Frist Center for um, hosting this exhibition and, and installing it in such a beautiful way. It's a real thrill for me to be here and see these objects that I've got to know in Boston up on the walls and, and really um, in, in fine feather. Is that how we say it? In fine feather. <laughs> <clears throat> and thanks to all of you for coming here tonight. Um, I wanted to say also before I begin that it's just, it's a very happy occasion for me to be here because this, this lecture and this exhibition opening um, marks a major milestone in the collecting and the appreciation of Islamic art at my museum, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, because this exhibition is the first stop on a tour. The exhibition will travel to Florida and perhaps another stop before it comes back to Boston. And that is and this is the first major exhibition, first tour of the Islamic art collection that the museum has done, the museum in Boston has done in decades. So this is really us um, getting into our Islamic collection once again after quite a long time and, and learning about it again and looking at it through a new light. 
So I'm very excited to be present to see the exhibition open and also to have a chance to share some of the ideas behind the exhibition with all of you tonight. The germ of the idea for this show came several years ago when my colleagues and I realized that in order to send 100 Islamic objects on the road in a touring exhibition, many of them would need major conservation work. Metalwork would need cleaning and polishing, paintings would need stabilization, ceramics would need to be taken apart and put back together again. The hundreds of hours that conservators were about to spend would, we realized, offer us unique opportunities to learn about what our objects were made of and how they were constructed, and to look for signs of use and evidence of alteration. And so that's what we did. We tested the metal objects, we examined the paintings under a high-powered microscope, and we analyzed their pigments. We learned which paintings were made with lapis and what alloy our bronze vessels were constructed from. We discovered that while most of a large wooden door is from the 14th century, some of it was actually only about 100 years old. These bits and pieces of information, at first, seemed to me simply to reflect the material and physical character of our objects. But then I came across an article in which the scholar Avinoam Shalem argued for an Islamic art history that considered the materials and colors and shapes of medieval Islamic objects, not as facts, but as bearers of meaning. And I thought, huh. It's true that Islamic art mostly consists of useful things, objects held in the hand or worn on the body. And so their physical properties would certainly shape the way they were used, experienced, understood. So let's try this out, I thought. Let's see whether looking at material offers us a way to get at what I, as an art historian, am always looking for, a sense of what these objects meant to the people who made them and used them, to the people who inherited, bought, or stole them later on, to those who fixed them or altered them to suit a new taste, and even to the, to the individuals who placed them in the museum. Among all the materials that have been used by the creators of Islamic artworks at any time, ink is perhaps the most ubiquitous. This is not to say that its uses and meanings were constant. They were not. But, but just that from the earliest Islamic societies onwards, ink was always a critical medium for the communication of culture and the creation of art. So let's start just by looking briefly at ink itself. Put simply, ink is a liquid containing pigments or dyes. It tends to be fluid and smooth so that, when, so that when it's used to paint or draw or write, it creates lines or forms that can be very fine. The oldest form of black ink is thought to be carbon ink made from charcoal or soot and mixed with a substance that allows it to be fixed on the paper. Carbon ink has a deep black color and sometimes a surface sheen and it tends not to fade, although it can smudge or even wash off. The other main type of black ink is known as iron gall ink, and it's been made since at least the fifth century BC. Though its name sounds unfamiliar to most of us, iron gall ink was popular for a very long time around the ancient and medieval world because it was inexpensive, could be made at home, and was, was ideal for use on parchment and vellum. You just needed to soak oak tree galls which are growths caused by wasps, in water, in an iron pot, which gave you iron sulfate. And then you add gum arabic, which is hardened sap from acacia trees. And this gave you a rich, dark brown ink, almost black. Now, bearing this in mind, let me guide you through one of the discoveries we made during work on the Islamic collection in preparation for this exhibition. If you'll permit me a little silliness, I'll call it a tale of two inks. The conservator who treats all of our Islamic works on paper <clears throat> in the MFA Boston, she and I went through about six boxes in storage looking for Quran pages that would be good for this exhibition. Each box had about 10 or 20 pages. All of them had once been part of intact manuscripts of the Quran. Um, 
in the 19th century, separating out pages from these manuscripts and selling them individually was what was quite common. Um, and a, as a result, we have a lot of single pages. Of course, today, um, that practice is frowned upon. So we took out all of these pages from the boxes in storage, and they all had text on both sides, just like any page from any book. One of the mu most beautiful pages had one side that was in great condition and another side that seemed damaged and faded. We thought we could, sh we could frame it to show the nice side and leave the faded side facing the wall. The nice side was subsequently photographed, and that is the image you see here. It's the nice, the quote unquote nice side. A few weeks after the photo was taken, I sat down with the conservator to look at the page again more closely this time. I wanted to understand better how it was made. We turned the microscope on and slid the page below it, nice side up. I looked through the lens and saw crisp jet black ink on vellum or parchment, we're not sure which. This was clearly carbon black ink, and we were surprised because, as I mentioned, iron gall ink was more popular for use on vellum. So we flipped the page over to see what clues the other side might hold, and we saw the warm brown color of iron gall ink. There was no question, one side was written with carbon ink and the other side iron gall ink. What was going on here? Why would someone switch inks halfway through copying a page from the Quran? Eventually we figured out that the calligraphy on the side I thought was so nice was not in fact original. It had been written in carbon ink over earlier lines in iron gall ink. The side that I had so admired as the nice side had actually been totally altered and redone. And I was embarrassed to have thought that it was the better of the two because curators are supposed to know when something is real. I consulted a colleague of mine who specializes in this area. He works particularly with early Qurans. And he soon explained it all to me. This rewriting of the text on one side of a page, uh, of a page from a, a parchment Quran was not necessarily recent. It hadn't necessarily been done recently, and it wasn't necessarily meant to deceive. Rather, it was a long-standing practice in the Islamic world for taking care of Qurans on parchment. You see, the hair, the hair side, the, the hair side of parchment, even after it's scraped and cleaned is left with tiny indentations where the hair follicles used to be. When you write, the ink sinks into the holes and it stays there very well. But on the flesh side, the surface is smooth so the ink rubs off quite easily. As a result, early Qurans are often left with one side on which the original ink is still there and still clear and dark and the other side on which the ink has rubbed away almost disappearing entirely. Because of this, many early Qurans have been re-inked, they call it re-inked, over the centuries, often using a dark carbon ink. Faint outlines of the original text are still there, so the scribe can follow the form of the original calligraphy very closely. That's why I couldn't see any stylistic difference between the two sides of our page. So what I'd thought was the nice side was the flesh side, on which the original text and many fine details had rubbed off, necessitating new calligraphy. The side that I had thought was too faded to show was in fact the hair side on which the original ink had stayed put. And armed with this new understanding, I went back to examine the page one more time. And this time when I looked at that side with the original iron gall ink, I noticed all sorts of tiny, beautiful details that I had never noticed before, like this writ letter written in green and gold, surrounded by tiny white dots, almost like a, like a strand of pearls running around the edges of it. It's not difficult, I don't think, to imagine why someone would want to go to the trouble of redoing the text on the damaged side of this Quran page. Legibility, they wanted to be able to read the words. But this isn't necessarily the whole story. For reading, for writing, and ink itself had come during the early centuries of Islamic culture to be associated with some powerful ideas, with divinity in particular. And this would have shaped the way that this act of preservation and the page itself was understood. Let me see what my next picture is. 
The association of ink and writing with divinity can be traced back to the fact that or, according to Muslim tradition, the Quran was orally transmitted from God to the Prophet Muhammad and from Muhammad to his followers, but very quickly it began to be written down. Since the words of the Quran were understood to be God's own words, it was critical that they be written accurately and without distortions of any kind. The revelation of the Quran was a miracle, and its copying down needed to be a perfect record of that miracle. In this way, calligraphy became a revered practice. Quranic verses tell us that it was God himself who taught man to write. And quoting one verse, recite by thy most beneficent Lord who taught the use of the pen, who teaches man that which he knows not. Other Islamic traditions hold that the first thing God created was the pen, and the next was the nun, or inkwell. And here's a picture of a nun, so you can see its, its similarity to an inkwell. Perhaps the most evocative Quran verse is this one, if all the trees on earth were pens, and all the seas, with seven more besides, were ink, still God's words would not run out. God is almighty and all wise. In some periods, these powerful associations were invoked through inscriptions and images, as with a medieval inkwell from Eastern Iran, bearing pictures of scribes with paper, pen, and pen knife and inkwell. One inscription on this inkwell reads, a man's inkwell is the water of his life, and the life of a man is in the water of his inkwell, and the inkwell is the cause of his salvation. This notion of ink as profoundly connected to God and to life itself ensured that writing was always taken very seriously in Islamic societies. Entire books were produced in the medieval world, in medieval Islamic world, in praise of writing and writing implements. The inkwell, pen, ink, and other writing implements were closely associated with the prestige of writing itself and were painstakingly made by artists and scribes themselves. Now I'd like to give you a few more examples of objects in the exhibition that reflect some different ways that ink was used and understood at different times and places. Here is one volume, ah, sorry, one more pen box. Okay, here is one volume from a 30 volume Quran. You'll notice that there isn't a whole lot of ink on these pages, although, of course, it's written in black uh, carbon ink. There are just three lines of text written in black ink on each side here, on each page here. The scribe, I think, could have fit six or eight lines on these pages if he'd put them closer together. Maybe he could have fit 20 lines if he wrote in smaller letters. That he instead chose to space out the lines and write in a, at a large scale tells us that he intended from the very beginning to spread the text of the Quran out among many volumes, 30 volumes. To do so, he would need a whole lot of paper, leather for 30 bindings, and plenty of blue and gold pigment for the decoration. So you can tell just from looking at this that this was planned to be a substantial work. In the medieval era, most large and elaborate Qurans, Qurans like this were made for rulers or elites at the highest levels. When this is the case, you sometimes find a note on the final page <clears throat> that says something like, copied by so-and-so by the order of so-and-so. If you're lucky, that note, called a colophon, will also provide the date the manuscript was finished and the place where it was made. In this copy of the Quran, the colophons that appear at the end of each volume say all of this and more. The scribe names himself as Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Fazallah ibn Abd al-Hamid al-Qadi al-Kazvini. The name al-Qadi, that was one bit of that very long name, al-Qadi, suggests that he may have been, in fact, a judge. And al-Kazvini tells, tells us that he was from the Iranian city of Kazvin. These colophons or notes also tell us that when he began copying this Quran, he had reached the great age of 70, this is his words, the great age of 77 years. The dates recorded in the various volumes show that he took a year to complete the project, beginning in April of 1338 and finishing in April of 1339. We are also told that he copied the manuscript in the city of Maraga in the hills of northwestern Iran. 
This wealth of information is very unusual. But what makes it particularly curious is the reference to the scribe's age. Why is it there? It suggests to me that this individual's identity, the scribe's identity, mattered to those who were going to own and read this copy of the Quran. This fact and the absence of any reference to a patron for whom the, the Quran might have been made makes it seem as though it was probably a personal project sponsored by the scribe himself. Now add to this another interesting fact that al although this Quran contains beautiful and very varied decorative motifs in lovely shades of blue, and these were most likely made by a professional illuminator, the calligraphy really isn't up to the same standard. Connoisseurs of Arabic calligraphy might say that the calligraphy is rather stiff. It is probably not the work of a professional scribe. Here, let me go back here. So here's one hypothesis to explain all of this. Maybe the manuscript was made by and for an affluent judge who was also an amateur calligrapher. If so, his reasons appear to have been personal. Could it be that upon reaching his late 70s and contemplating his mortality, he chose to copy the Quran as a way to strive towards a higher spiritual state, or maybe to express the depth of his piety? Whatever our judge's precise reasons, the inky lines that he spread across 30 volumes and interspersed with illumination communicate to me an impressive constancy and dedication to his faith. Ink here, I would suggest, conveys not only the words of God, but also the devotion of one of his followers. A few centuries later, in the, Islamic, in the Eastern Islamic world, ink took on new associations with moral, intellectual, and aesthetic cultivation. We can see this in the way that small panels of Persian calligraphy began to be collected and preserved in albums. Paintings, drawings, and texts often accompanied them, and careful readers of these albums were rewarded with the pleasure of finding subtle links between the form and content of these different components. These were elite objects, these beautiful albums. They were designed to be appreciated by those who had been well-trained in art and literature. In such albums, ink is a material wielded with elegance by elites. This album page was made in 17th century India for the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan. I like to imagine him examining it in one of his palaces where flower imagery like that you see in the, in the borders here had become ubiquitous. The floral patterns were intended, the floral patterns at Shah Jahan's palaces and in all of his art were, no, and particularly in the palaces, were intended, some scholars believe, to give a sense that his kingdom was a sort of paradise or a heaven on earth. Here we have blossoming flowers outlined in gold, birds cavorting in pairs, grass-covered ground that appears at the lower edge, so down here, and also right here. <clears throat> As glorious as these borders are, the centerpiece of the page is a small panel with two Persian couplets inscribed in ink. A self-deprecating signature in the bottom left corner reads, the poor Ali, and it associates these lines with the famous Persian calligrapher, Mir Ali Haravi, who worked in the early 16th century in Iran. He was a master. His expertise is evident here in the elongated letters that balance the overall composition of each line Letters like this and this. And also in the precise dotting of the letters to create a pleasing sense of rhythm. When I look at this page overall, I'm struck by the idea that, that these four lines of Persian at the page's center are, are almost, I imagine somehow, that they're sustaining the virgin garden around them in the borders. Ink flows across the page like the streams that nourished Shah Jahan's palace gardens. It's the essence, ink here, I, I'm, I would argue, is the essence of cultivation, refinement, and beauty. Now let's look at one more way of treating ink from the Islamic world. A starkly different approach to ink is apparent in this drawing from the Iranian city of Isfahan. In the late 16th century, 
a time when Persia was exp experiencing swift political, economic, and cultural change. Isfahan's artist responded by challenging older ideas about what ink was for and what it could do. So imagine this artist almost as posing a direct challenge to this guy. Foremost among these artists was, was Reza Abbasi, who created this drawing. When he was just starting out, Riza had used ink in a traditional manner to carefully delineate popular subjects, like, for example, long-necked figures in swaying poses. <clears throat> but by the last years of the 16th century, he had begun to use ink more expressively, to put down lines that vary greatly in their weight and that swoop and dive across the page. Here, Riza's vision is of a young man holding prayer beads. The lines that demarcate the fluttering ends of his robe and his turban seem almost to have a life of their own. The ink arcs, slashes, and wiggles. It forms tiny triangles where, for a moment, Riza pressed the tip of his pen to the page. His, his use of ink was daring. It was idiosyncratic and expressive. In his, in his hands, ink became a medium through which to, to communicate an individual's artistic vision. Now, ink is linked, at least in the examples that we've seen tonight, to a range of internal characteristics like piety, cultivation, creativity. In contrast, objects of Islamic art that are made of silk are often more, more linked to exterior traits like wealth and status. <clears throat> Sink is a material that's profoundly linked to the worldly arena of the royal court in Islamic societies as it is in numerous others. And one reason, perhaps, is that knowledge about how to produce fine thread from the fibers of silkworm cocoons was for centuries carefully guarded in China and only gradually transmitted westward. In each place it came to, this exquisite material was quickly adopted for royal use and sometimes exclusively for, for royalty. One feature that made it attractive and I find this so fascinating. I didn't know this a few weeks ago. One feature that made silk attractive was its natural sheen, which is caused by these almost triangular sort of teardrop structures within a silk filament. There are two, one here and one here, within each silk filament. And because they're triangular or almost triangular, they act like prisms and they reflect light. Silk reached different parts of the Middle East at different times. Silk weaving and cultivation was established in Persia by the period of the Sasanian Empire, the third to seventh century or so. Sasanian silks, like the one you see here, were widely traded, and their patterns, particularly these pearl-edged roundels containing symbols of power and kingship, these patterns were copied by weavers both east and westward from Persia. Silk arrived around the fourth century in the lands of the Byzantine Empire, where sophisticated brocaded silks were woven for the Byzantine emperor in Constantinople's royal workshops. Strict le legislation in Byzantium granted monopolies over sil certain silk garments to the emperor, and gifts of silk textiles were an important part of diplomacy. When lands that belonged to these two empires, the Sasanian and Byzantine empires, when these lands came under Arab conquest in the 7th and 8th centuries, the cultivation and weaving of silk had already become deeply rooted there. These practices continued after the, con the Arab conquest with very little interruption. And the luxurious silks that Sasanian and Byzantine high society had enjoyed now became the luxury goods of Muslim elites. The gifting of fine garments as diplomacy also continued though it took a new shape in Islamic societies. Muslim rulers formally presented something called khila, <coughs> fine garments made in royal factories, to subjects, visiting heads of state, and envoys. During the Abbasid era, which was the second of the major dynasties of the Islamic world, during the Abbasid era, the gifting of these robes of honor became such a regular part of Islamic court life that members of the caliph's entourage came to be known as those who wear the khila. Such robes were often made of, very, of brightly colored silk, and their quality varied as much as their color. Robes of very fine, of fine, silk, were, robes of fine silk were sometimes reserved for high-ranking courtiers 
whereas texts tell us that plain silk garments were received by those further down in the pecking order. Without a doubt, the most remarkable silk textile that we examined during the process of preparing this exhibition is one that is rather famous in the world of Islamic art history. Its pattern features pairs of lions and human-headed birds. Here's the lion's heads, and here are the, the human heads of the birds. And they're inside roundels. In the borders of the roundels are kneeling human figures grasping the, the legs of eagle up here, legs of eagle and lion-headed griffins, complicated iconography. Linking together these, these, um, these large roundels are these smaller ones here. They con contain a floral motif at the center and an Arabic inscription around it, which is written both normally and in reverse. So it's there in regular Arabic and in, mirror, in a mirror image. This fragmentary textile was discovered in the tomb of a Spanish bishop in, the cathedral in, in a cathedral in northern Spain, and it's often referred to as the Baghdad silk. It has this name because of the inscription that I was just mentioning in the small roundels. These, the inscriptions in these roundels says, it was made in the town of Baghdad, and may God guard it. When this silk was first published in the 1930s, the scholars who wrote about it took that inscription at face value. They proposed that the silk had been made in Baghdad in the, the 11th or 12th century. When it was examined again in the 40s and 50s, however, it was realized that it must have been made in Spain, not Baghdad. So let me explain. When textile scholars looked at the weave structure of this textile, they found that it had a, a peculiar characteristic. I got to see this feature myself through a microscope, microscope in the textile conservation lab at the MFA, where we took this photo through the, through the microscope. In the background of the textile, which is cream colored, although here it looks reddish, but it actually is, is, well, you can see here, it's more cream colored. So in the background, this is a shot of the background, the warps, which are the vertically oriented threads, are bundled together in groups of two and four. So if you look closely, you can see that the, these vertical threads occur, are bundled in a pattern of two, two, four, two, two, four. Two warps, two warps, four warps. Do you see it? Does anybody see it? Oh, you can. Okay, good. I showed this to my husband and he said, don't worry if no one gets it. I can't see it. <laughs> okay. The bundling of these threads gave the background a particularly dense and smooth surface. So probably they did that for this reason. They wanted to create this dense, smooth surface. Well, it turns out that this is a very unusual weave structure. It's in fact only found in a group of text, uh, textiles that survive in church treasuries and tombs in Spain. These are among the most luxurious and complex silks known from Islamic Spain. Still more evidence that it was made in Spain is that all of these silks are decorated with roundels inhabited by mythical creatures. They all use a palette of red and green on cream, and each one of them shows certain idiosyncrasies in the, in the lettering of their inscriptions. Today, it's accepted that the so-called Baghdad silk was indeed made in Spain around 1100. So one has to ask, why? Why does the inscription identify this silk textile as a product of a Baghdad workshop? I, um, I think the answer is that, or probably that, uh, they, they did this for the same reason that Gucci handbags, fake Gucci handbags, are made today. Um, the weavers were able to make more money by copying fine Baghdadi silks and, and passing them off as being from Baghdad itself. That Baghdad silks were, were highly valued in Spain is shown by another little bit of evidence that in the medieval Spanish city of Almeria, there was a type of textile sold called atabi, and the name of that type of textile comes from the Atabia quarter of Baghdad, which was famous for its cloth. So now let's look at a couple other cases of silk and the use of silk in different examples of Islamic art. Silk's importance as a symbol of prosperity and status meant that it was sometimes put to one might, what, one, what one might call aspirational uses. 
Used sparingly and cleverly, it could enhance a garment that was otherwise plain, and in the process, endow its wearer with, a, with an aura of grandeur. This fragment from a garment was probably made in Egypt in the 10th or 11th century. It uses silk in limited quantities, but to great effect. The cream-colored foundation is linen, a type of textile that had, been, that had been produced in Egypt for millennia before the arrival of Islam. So it's mostly made up of linen, a common textile in Egypt. Silk was woven into the linen using a technique called slit tapestry. And the result is bands of decoration featuring plant motifs, ribbons that wind around tiny images of hares and swans, and red pseudo-Arabic letters. The letters are hard to see, but if you look, do you see the, the red shapes down here and then the lines that extend up? These are, we think, intended to resemble Arabic letters. These silken letters are not legible and they were probably never intended to be. The wearer surely did intend, the weaver though, surely did intend them to be noticed and probably hoped that they would evoke thoughts of the Arabic language, which was and continues to be held in high esteem in Islamic societies. So I think of it this way, that the silk adds color and texture, and the pseudo letters of Arabic add associations with Islamic knowledge, tradition, and authority. What could be more impressive than, an, than Arabic letters in silk? A garment like the sash worn in this painting from Mughal India conveys status too, but through an overabundance of deluxe materials such as silk, and their masterful manipulation, rather than through their strategic, limited use. In India, garments of silk often accompanied cotton clothing rather than linen, as we saw in the Egyptian example. In India, gar um, India had been the world's most important center for cotton production for most of the last 5,000 years. This type of sash, called a patka, is a long, narrow garment worn around the waist to cinch a cotton outer garment. It, is, it has pattern ends that hang down in front of the knees. The patka was an essential part of elite dress in 16th to 18th century India during the heyday of the Mughal Empire. Some have described it as comparable to the necktie today. Like ties, the length of the ends and the position of the knot changed according to the fashion of the times. This silk patka from the Mughal era is among the finest known. The brilliant red of the poppies and the bold chevron pattern above them, all of which were woven, not painted, and also the abundance of silk threads wound with strips of gold combined to make it particularly striking. Though you can't tell just by looking at it in these photos, the way it was woven is also an amazing feature. The borders and ends, so I, when I, it, this goes on, uh, it's a very long garment, so there's a lot of this deep blue, but all the way along run these borders with flowers, and then here's one of the ends. Just these borders and ends were created using a complex structure. Um, <clears throat> a complex structure that has, according to textile scholars, no known antecedent or parallel. They're made of two layers of silk that are entirely separable. One is a twill, a weave with a pattern of diagonal ribs, and the other is a plain weave, one with a checkered surface. So in order to make this garment, they had to switch, for example, up here, they had to switch back and forth between two layers, one layer, two layer. Switching back and forth between these different areas must have been extremely difficult. So why did they do it? One possibility is that the weavers chose this doubled structure just for those areas because a good patka needed to be thin in some places and thick in others. In other words, the blue part was easy to bundle and tie because it was thin, while the ornamental ends hang down heavily because they were double layered. Looked at from this point of view, you can see that the weaver must have been intimately familiar with the nature of silk, its weight, and its flexibility. The spiffy fellow, do we have another picture of him? Yeah, here. The spiffy fellow who wore this garment must have been aware of how easy it was to wear, to, to tie. More surprisingly, he may also have been aware of its technical complexity. Textual sources from literature to tax records suggest that 
medieval elites in Islamic societies were much more familiar with textiles than most people today. One scholar has looked at the vast terminology for textile techniques in medieval Islamic literature and concluded the following, quote, the Islamic use of textile terminology may be, may be compared with the Eskimos' differentiation of some 40 types of snow or the Bedouins' insistence on multiple terms for the camel. This most certainly her, held true for silk. Let's turn now finally to silk's place in the Islamic religious arena. Silk does appear in Islamic religious texts. Quranic verses describe the, the paradise gardens that will be enjoyed by those found worthy on the day of judgment as places in which believers lounge on silken cushions and carpets and, wave garment, and, and wear garments made of this deluxe material. But wearing silk before the day of judgment has a less positive connotation. Indeed, a famous saying attributed to Muhammad is, quote, he who wears silk in this world will forgo it in the next. Despite this ambivalence, silk has sometimes been used in Islamic religious contexts. For example, as a covering for the Kaaba, the cube-shaped building in Mecca that is considered the holiest place in the Islamic world. In the first centuries of Islam, this covering was woven from a range of materials in Yemen, Egypt, and eastern Iran, among other places. Silk eventually became the preferred material, and surviving examples from the early Ottoman period are made of red, black, and green silk with inscriptions embroidered in silver and gold thread. Perhaps one reason that silk came to be used is that, producing, that, that the producing of these Kaaba coverings was both a responsibility and a privilege. It was the duty of whichever ruler controlled the Hijaz, which is the region that contains Mecca and Medina, it was the duty of whichever ruler contained, con controlled that area to create the coverings for the Kaaba. And as we have seen, rulers tend to prefer silk. Today, this covering is black and produced in a factory in Mecca. It continues to be made of silk and embroidered with metallic thread, although I believe the silk is now made in Italy and Switzerland. This fragment, from a period when the Ottomans controlled Mecca, would have been draped over the interior of the Kaaba. Its inscriptions exhort followers to turn towards the Kaaba in prayer. Like silk, gold has tended to be valued in Islamic societies broadly, while being a subject of concern in religious contexts. The Quran mentions gold in a positive light in descriptions of paradise. Dishes and goblets of gold will be passed around them with all that their souls desire and their eyes delight in. But when it comes to the use of gold in the earthly realm, Islamic religious texts are less optimistic. They warn against extravagance, which could lead to arrogance. Several verses of the Quran explicitly prohibit the hoarding of gold and silver, probably for economic reasons as well as moral ones. Oh, this, I wanted you to look at this while you're thinking about paradise, little, and drawing with little touches of gold. But anyway, the, the hoarding of gold was prohibited probably also par partly for economic reasons, um, because there were, there were active gold and silver mines in medieval Arabia, as there are today, and the circulation of these metals probably played an important role in helping early Islamic society to flourish. Despite these strictures on the use of gold, its desirability is nearly a universal principle. The raw material of gold is, generally speaking, so highly valued and so easy to melt down that things like gold jewels or vessels rarely survive from the Islamic world. What does survive are innumerable textiles, paintings, and ceramics in which gold is ingeniously applied, for example, as paint, as you see here, to another material. In Persia and Mesopotamia during the 12th and 13th centuries, for example, metal workers developed methods for covering a bronze or brass object with dazzling metallic decoration using only tiny amounts of the precious alloys. Over time, this technique evolved, and by the 14th century, metal workers in Persia, Egypt, and Syria were using it to create what one scholar has called paintings in silver and gold. 
Of all my encounters with gold over the course of this project, the most stunning was the experience of looking again through a microscope at the gold calligraphy on a page from the Blue Quran, a celebrated and unique copy of the Muslim scripture. The manuscript, which was created sometime in the 9th or 10th century and partly dispersed among various museums and collections during the Ottoman period, is famed for its dramatic use of indigo dyed vellum and gold in Arabic writing. The color scheme may have been intended to be understood symbolically, as if the words of God gave off a divine light that could penetrate any darkness. It's also possible that it was intended to rival Byzantine manuscripts of the Bible, written in gold and silver ink on purple or blue parchment. Looking through the microscope, we were able to see that this gold text was probably not so much written down as pressed onto the page. The scribe would have first copied out the text using adhesive, creating lines of sticky but transparent letters, really almost like writing in invisible ink. The scribe himself would, have, would not have been able to see them standing out against the page. Next, he would have laid down gold leaf over the words, and then when the sheets were pulled away, golden letters would have been left behind. As you can see in this photo, the letters were then outlined with a dark pigment, making them stand out even more starkly against the page. Gold is also used in the Blue Quran for motifs that appear throughout the text to mark chapter and verse divisions. So there's a big one here, and then there are smaller ones in other spots. At first glance, however, one notices only grayish motifs, like the large circle in the right margin of this page. It's actually made of silver, which has become tarnished. Under the microscope, however, you can see that beneath this silver motif is gold. And in fact, not just gold, but also small areas of red and green pigment. There's a little bit of red up here, and you can see some tiny bits of green down there. It seems that when the manuscript was originally made, both its text and its verse markers were made of gold enhanced with color. At some point in its history, some of the gold was covered over with silver. Why? I have no idea. Uh, the reason is still un unknown. Um, and this aspect of the Blue Quran remains a continual subject of debate today. Now let's look at a different aspect of the use of gold. The wearing of this precious material on the body as clothing or jewelry. This has been a common practice among the wealthy members of nearly every Islamic society, including those of the Bougainese people of southern Sulawesi, an island in Indonesia. Islam became a part of their culture in the early 17th century. This pair of ceremonial caps was made for a member of that royal family, the Bougainese royal family, who would have worn the blue-black one before traveling to Mecca to perform the Hajj, and the white one upon completion of the pilgrimage to Mecca. By the early 20th century, when these caps were made, items of dress that identified the wearer as having performed the, law, the Hajj had begun to carry a political message of opposition to Dutch colonialism. The reason? Those who returned to India from the Hajj often came back empowered to resist colonial rule. There were regulations on what kinds of garments people could wear after they returned from Mecca. It's possible that the wearer of these caps, particularly the one on the left, would therefore have been seen as making a, been seen as making a defiant statement. But it's not only the color that hints at a challenge. The gold band on each cap signified its owner's rank within the indigenous power structure of the Bougainese royal family. There are a number of pairs of caps like this in, different, uh, in, in various museums, and some of them have a much thicker gold band than we have here. The thicker the band, the higher the standing within the, within the family. With color signifying religious identity and gold marking authority, these caps seem to me to create a subtle but powerful message of pride and possibly resistance. But not all gold clothing certainly carries political associations. Robes adorned with gold appear in illustrated manuscripts made for the upper echelons of society in medieval Iran and Central Asia. 
And in these contexts, the use of gold often simply connotes beauty and allure. In this painting, which is actually only 10 centimeters in height, a prince in a blue robe with, with blue embroidered, sorry, a blue robe with gold embroidered cuffs reaches out to grasp the hem of his lady's robe, which is also decorated with golden flowering patterns. These delicate details would have been created with gold paint applied with a brush. There's a bit more to it than this, though. The gold rectangular panels in the upper corners, these two panels, are a clue that in this page, this painting, may once have been part of an illustrated manuscript. If so, these rectangles probably contained a few lines of Persian poetry, of Persian calligraphy. My guess is that the painting was removed from the manuscript so that it could be sold, and that at that time, gold paint, or possibly gold leaf, was used to cover up the now isolated bits of text that would have been written in those two rectangles. The possibility that this was a page from a poetic manuscript is significant because gold in Persian poetry brings up the notion or is associated with the idea of alchemy. And that's an important concept in Sufism, mystical Islam. Alchemy, the transformation of base metals into gold, is used in, per in Persian poetry as a metaphor for the mystical process by which a human soul is transformed and purified through love of God. In the words of one scholar, quote, the pale golden cheeks of the true lover bear witness to the painful process of suffering in the fire of love. If this painting once had lines from a Sufi poem in its upper corners, then the golden hillside at its center may have stood in for the pure soul our prince yearns for. Maybe that explains why the hillside and the woman are positioned at the center of this image rather than the prince himself. Gold is also associated with alchemy in the final example that I want to look at today. This large bowl was probably made in the Persian city of Kashan. <clears throat> it was made using a, a technique known as luster glazing, possibly the most important innovation of Islamic potters. This type of luxury ceramic was made by painting thin layers of metallic glaze over a white surface. Although the glazes were made with copper and silver oxides, not with gold. After firing in a specially prepared kiln, the glazes gleamed like gold. You, could, you put in copper and silver, and you got out gold. It's no wonder, then, that after the technique was developed in Iraq in the ninth century, it spread to Egypt, Syria, Iran, and Spain. Pottery exported from Spain to Italy inspired the, the creation of Italian maiolica, another form of luster ceramics. In each city to which potters brought knowledge of the luster process, it was hailed as miraculous and used in unique ways. A 14th century treatise by the Persian potter Abul Qasim says of lusterware that properly produced, quote, it reflects like red gold and shines like the light of the sun. The sun, in fact, appears on this bowl, which is covered with concentric rings of astrological imagery. Right at the center is a lion representing Leo, up here. And he is standing before a golden solar disk. The golden surface of the luster gives the impression that this central sun image radiates golden rays out from the center of the bowl in the same way that it illuminates the cosmos. In the course of this talk, I've tried to suggest that ink, silk, and gold have been meaningful materials in Islamic societies, and that they can be a good lens through which to see works of Islamic art, and see how these works of Islamic art were understood at different times. In museums, I think, it can sometimes be easier to get to know an object when we narrow our field of vision down to a single element, to one that we can see with our own eyes, rather than trying to see how the object fits into the big picture of religion, art, and society. In my opinion, by just looking at these three materials, we can see quite a lot. Thank you very much.
think we have a little bit of time to take some questions if there are any. Or you can come up afterwards and chat with me if you like. Yes, but one. Calligraphy actually uh, is a very, uh, still a very strong um, art in the Middle East and in Iran. I knew a, uh, an Iranian calligrapher who uh, uh, still practiced it and moved here to the United States after the uh, Islamic Revolution and the U.S. Embassy was taken over. But, uh, but I know that they uh, are very concerned about calligraphy and all that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, the, the silks were woven with looms. Um, there's a specific type of loom that was an innovation um, that I'm trying to remember what it's called. Draw looms. They were woven with a draw loom which actually was a type of loom that was used, I think, all the way across Asia and eventually in Europe as well. Um, so it's not a particularly unique uh, weaving method. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming.